The day I'm with the author of this document, Defining the Summits and Coals of Hills, and that author is... Graham. <laughs> Graham Jackson. Hiya, Hi. Graham. Hi there, Merlin. How are you? All right? Yes, yeah, not too bad. Well done. Well, I've mentioned the document, Graham, and mm. uh, obviously that's the reason for doing this interview. But um, before we start going into the depths and the details of it, it may be quite nice to lay a little bit of background about you and your involvement with the hills and how you discovered them to a great extent and took up hill walking. So when did that happen? Um, well, I didn't take up hill walking until um, quite late in my life, really. I was about 35, I think, before I went up my first hill. My, my love of hills developed when I was about six or seven years old. And uh, living in the Midlands, which is pretty flat, uh, my parents and some friends of theirs uh, we went on a holiday together to uh, North Wales. And I remember going along a road underneath a big craggy hill with what looked like two people on the top. And when we got to the boarding house, which you went to in those days, you didn't have hotels, um, the lady said, oh, they weren't people, that was Adam and Eve, that was a mountain called Triffin. And I thought, that is fantastic, you know, how do people climb mountains like that? And that lived with me for many years. And then when I started work, I shared an office with a guy who was a very keen rock climber. He was um, from Birmingham University and um, part of their climbing club. And uh, they had a hut in the Lake District at Coniston and a hut at uh, Ogwen. And we organised two lads weekends in both of those respective huts and had a fantastic time. And it was that that really got me um, into hill walking. Now, of course, over subsequent years, you've completed some of the major listings in Britain, haven't you? Yes, that's, uh, that, that, that's right. I bought a book, which uh, I think my wife rused the day that she wanted to go in the uh, Allegan uh, post office. And uh, there was a book there on some hills called the Munros. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that's about. So uh, I bought this book and read it. I thought, hey, this looks pretty good. I'm doing some of these. And um, about that time... Uh, my job took me into ICI Acrylics and I came across this bloke called John Barnard who said, oh, I go up to uh, Scotland every month with a group from work. Why don't you join us? Um, and so I did, and that was the uh, the start of the slippery slope. <laughs> and the other listings, you've completed the Munros? Uh, yeah, I d- did the Munros in 95, uh, and then completed the Corbett's in 2000 <clears throat> and the Graham's in 2005. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, my wife Janet and I did the 2,000 foot hills. What was it? About three years ago, was it? I can't remember now. On uh, on Crossfell, yeah. So there's obviously quite a lot of hill walking experience there. Now, we have done one previous interview, and that was concerning the database of British hills as it was then. That's right. I remember that well. And it's now the database of British and Irish hills. Yeah. Now, a little bit of detail was gone into why that uh, was set up and how it has evolved. So for those that want to, they can go back and look at the previous video. So if we just very quickly mention that, because that comes on to the surveying, mm. and the surveying comes on to the document. So very quickly, Graham, with the, um, with the database, how did your hill walking activities then progress to start something up like that? Um, I think as we said in that video where then I, uh, I I was doing the 2,000 foot hills with Janet for I mean we, we just went out and did hills you know and gradually we realized we were doing 2,000 foot hills and then I, I bought John and Anne Nuttall's book and, and we sort of got more serious about about doing them systematically and um, Janet said to me one day oh can you tell me how many hills I've done and so I said oh look I'll put it into a spreadsheet for you and in fact I put it into Microsoft Access and um, I thought, oh, this is actually, you know, if we do this, then I could put all of the nuttles in and I could put the Munros and the Munro tops and the Corbett's. And if I had to put all of those in, this could make quite an interesting little database for, for me, you know, to put, put all my um, <clears throat> all my ascents in. And uh, one day on a meet in Scotland with, uh, with the lads from work, I was talking about it to Chris Crocker, and he said, oh, I've just put a website together. He said, I quite fancy putting that on a website. Would you mind letting me have a copy? So I did, and Chris then, being Chris, very, very thorough, as you know, 
he went to town on it and tried to make sure all the data that were in there were as accurate as they could be. And uh, that's how it started life on his uh, on his website, and that was in the year 2000. Now, to a great extent, because of the database, yourself and Graham then extended, because of accuracy, I believe, into surveying. Yes, well, I mean, what, what happened was... It started out as a tool, really, just for people to record their ascents. Uh, and then we realised that we wanted to make it more... We wanted to get the data more accurate, and that became more of the driving force. And as that developed, about that time GPS technology was coming into walking, <clears throat> we bought GPSs and started recording um, ten-figure grid references for summits. And that got going. And then it was another discussion on one of these meets, uh, which John was, was part of, uh, and uh, we said, well, you know, OK, there might be a cairn there, but how do we know that it's the summit? And there are quite a few hills where it's not clear where the summit is. And we, we had quite a long, over a few beers, it must be said, we had quite a long discussion about this, and John said, well, look, I'll go away with the action, and what I'll do is I'll see what we can do to survey these things. Is it possible? And off he went and came back about a week or so later saying, hey, if we bought a level and staff for, you know, 150 quid, you know, we, we could get into this. We could do some things that are really serious. And uh, that's how it started. Now, of course, through the surveying activities, uh, the document has evolved to its uh, present uh, state. So if we now, um, it's a little bit of background about yourself and also the database and the surveying, but if we now start concentrating on the document itself, what was the um, the impetus be behind it and the motivation and, and the sort of reasoning? And I how... think it was you, wasn't it, Brian, really? <laughs> I mean, look, on, let's face it. <laughs> uh, I think you got us into it. We, we were in a cafe, I seem to remember, in Blair Athol, waiting for Polly, was it? And um, we got talking and we got onto the subject of what was the summit of a hill and how you determined it when there was something like um, a tower, as on Mulvama, for example, um, or there was that um, new structure on Penaclodie. Um What do you count as the summit? And that sort of extended, and, uh, as we talked about, in ooh, what about hill forts and what about Leith Hill that's got a tower on it? And, we saw oh, all these difficult summits and as we get more and more into surveying then we need to know how to be able to deal with these and I think I, I must have got the short straw or something or perhaps I went out to the toilet and when I came back you say oh Graham can you sort of write this up uh, <laughs> and uh, that's how it began and if you remember Merthyn we, we had about was it 10 iterations of it before we finally got it into um, a situation where we wanted to uh, uh, put it out into the public domain. Well, if I may say, Graham, the document has, has evolved rather quickly because to a great extent that wasn't too long ago, was it? It was about 18 months to two years yeah, or so? It was about, about 18 months ago and I think we got the, the first uh, drafts together pretty quickly but then what we've done since then, we've circulated it to many, many people and we've got a lot of um, interest and feedback from people <clears throat> and it does have to be said that a lot of that interest and feedback that was generated has, has gone into the document. Well, one of the most interesting things about the document is that you try to deal with a coll and a summit under the same rules, which sounds simple, but <clears throat> when you start surveying each, it does become rather complicated. It, it, it does, yeah, the, 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 the underlying tenets of the document I suppose are, are one that if the natural summit or the natural coll exists irrespective of what's built on it or near it you always take the natural summit if you can identify it um, uh, and that, that is that, that is one aspect that we've we've adhered to and the second aspect we've adhered to is yeah um, <coughs> try to treat summits in the same way as coals uh, that's not straightforward because a summit is just a a peak when you're on the top it's 360 degrees down whichever way you go on a col of course you've got a, a hill to hill direction and a valley to valley direction so you're dealing with something that's really the shape of a saddle um, and it's a different geometry so it's not straightforward but yeah that's what we attempt to do now of course 
You mentioned about um, sending out for con consultation to various people, and um, we'll get onto those people towards the end of the interview, as long as I remember to uh, to prompt you. But uh, through that consultation, there has um, arisen one or two complexities, isn't there? Uh, what are those, and why? Uh, well, quite a few complexities <laughs> have arisen. Now, you wouldn't be talking about covered reservoirs many times, well, would you? I think they they are one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, in the first or one of the early drafts of the document, um, quite a strong argument was put forward by um, some of us and, and our contributors that those reservoirs that were covered completely by grass were really nothing more than mounds, like ancient tumuli, for example, and therefore they should count and the summit of the hill would be the summit of the reservoir. When we put that out for wider consultation, there was a very strong view that came back from many, many people that said, well, hold on a minute. Really, all that is, is a concrete tank, or whatever it's built out of, covered in earth and then grass over it. And what's the difference between that and perhaps a building that has got grass around it? And, you know, where do you draw the line? And I have to say that was a very persuasive argument. And also that these structures, although they appear permanent to us, probably in a hundred years' time they'll be you know, abandoned and they'll be destroyed and covered over, uh, bulldozed down. So it was that feedback that said, yeah, we should change the document and covered reservoirs should not count. Because um, to my recollection, the uh, covered reservoirs were originally not in the document and then they entered and since they've been taken out again, haven't they? Um, yeah, they, they were out briefly, but there was quite a, a strong contingent within our group uh, and we sort of felt that um, there was a case for, for including them. Um, so yeah, they did start life actually being out and then they came in and then, <laughs> then they went out again, which is the power of consultation. <laughs> Another um, uh, thing that could be viewed as a slight complexity is the, um, the one of ancient man-made um, structures, on the, usually on summits of hills. Yes, we, we have a section of alternative views at the, the end of the document, I should say. Um, and that is one area where there is quite a lot of um, controversy. There's quite a strong contingent um, out there who say, well, you can distinguish between modern structures and ancient structures and different people will put a different date on that. The Industrial Re um, Revolution is, is one such idea. Um, I think another idea is um, AD, BC. Um, <coughs> and buildings or structures that were built before that date count, structures that were built after that date don't count. And um, we looked at that and we, you know, you acknowledge that there is an alternative view that is out there, but the way we have developed the document, if you can identify the natural summit, you take it. So even if there's an ancient structure, which every, you know, people would count, like a, a hill fort that, that has ramparts that are higher than the natural summit, you'd still take the natural summit. Um, if those um, ramparts of the, the hill fort cover or obliterate the natural summit, then you take the highest part of the hill fort, as long as it's um, not work stone um, or, or an obviously built structure from, um, from building materials, uh, you take the highest point. Now, of course, as far as a call is concerned, although um, it's been um, attempted, and very successfully, may I say so, to treat them in the same way with the same rules as for a summit, to an extent they are to an extent they are very different beasts, aren't they? They are different beasts for the reason that I I explained earlier. Yeah, because they are different shapes. Um, <clears throat> if you can identify the natural coal, you take it. Um, if you can identify the natural summit, you take it. If the natural summit has been quarried away, you take what's left. If the coal has been quarried away, you take what's left because there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, but if there was a cutting that was produced to one side of the coal, so that you could see where the natural coal was, you would take the natural coal. So the, the, the connection between the summit and the coal extend 
to, to those situations. But a coll is a very different beast, and when it comes to cuttings, it depends on a coll whether they're running hill to hill or valley to valley as to just exactly how they're treated, because it is a different uh, geometry. And of course, many of the things that you've been talking about for the last few minutes within the document um, are shown examples. Hmm. Yes, we, we give examples in the document of all of those where we are aware that examples exist. There are one or two where we, we haven't got examples. Um, the ones that we haven't got examples, do you know the, um, the specifications of those off, off by hand? Uh, off the top of my head, no, I'd have to <laughs> go back to the document. Um, but it's where you've got um, features in a col that are either running in a hill-to-hill -hill or a valley-to-valley -valley direction. And while we will have examples for one of those, we don't have examples for the, for the other. Now, as far as uh, things like covered reservoirs, we've mentioned uh, the consultation period. So it, it's probably um, apt now to um, just mention some of the major contributors and um, the people or the uh, organisations or the users group that the document went out to and um, those, that, uh, those that have contributed. Because some have in quite a major way, haven't they? Right, yeah. The, I think the, um, the list of contributors we, we give at the beginning of the document and I think there's, there's approximately 30 people, I think it's 28, 29, something like that, that have contributed um, in some way or another to the document um, and lo lots of different types of contribution have, have come in. Some people have put an awful lot into it, uh, some people have given us key points which we've not th thought of before but all of those 28, 29 people, whatever it is, uh, have made an input into the document. I would be very loath to give names Merlin, because if I give names and I don't give all 28 <laughs> Somebody's going to feel they've been missed out. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but suffice it to say that it's a document that started life with yourself and John and, um, and myself, and it has been thrown open much more widely since then to many corners of the Hillwalking community, and um, all of those corners have come back and given us um, a lot of um, very helpful feedback, and as we explained we've covered reservoirs to give one example of actually changed thinking in the document as well, um, and that has been a very, very valuable exercise, and I think you're referring to the um, <coughs> RHB news group where um, there, there was a lot of very useful um, feedback that came in from that which helped us to um, uh, to develop the document. You're being very diplomatic, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you always worry when you give um, when you give people that have contributed. If anybody out there is looking at this video and they say, "Wait a minute, I contributed to that and they didn't put my name on the buggers," please let let us know because uh, we will be um, very apologetic if we have missed somebody off and we'd want to make sure that people get recognised for what they've uh, what they've given us. Uh, but, they've been very helpful indeed. Now as far as the document itself, is it written in stone or is it fluid? No, it's on paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it is a fluid document in that um, it's taken us about 18 months to get to this point. Um, we will let it now run for 12 months or so and as we work with it and we may find shortcomings or things that aren't explained in the document other people may read it and say ah they've forgotten this or they've forgotten that and they'll email us in or write to us and let us know and over the next few months um, if and when we get in such contributions or our own knowledge extends the document uh, then we will uh, we, we will change it accordingly. And for um, those people that may view this uh, mm -hmm. video that um, have not come in contact with the document so far, where can it, where can it be accessed? Um, well if anybody wants to email us of course they, they, they are welcome to a, a copy, I can send them a PDF file or, or as a Word file. But there is a link on Chris Crocker's website, Database of British Hills and uh, sorry I should say database of British and Irish Hills I beg your pardon Merlin uh, and um, there is a link there in the surveying section I think which will take them to the document and they can download it or read it. Now as far as you mentioned an email if somebody wanted to access it via uh, that who should they contact? Uh, they can contact you or they can contact me or they can contact John 
Shall we give out our emails on them? We, we, or? We, they can find us through... Um, they'll find John and yourself through RHB and they can come through us that way. Yeah, and obviously that's a Yahoo users group for the yeah. uninitiated, yeah. isn't it? Well, Graham, um, it's been fascinating um, talking about the document today. It's... Um, it's probably quite unique, isn't it? I don't think even the Ordnance Survey, who have been approached and asked, I don't think their field surveyors have ever, have ever operated from um, any form of rule or regulation as far. Not in this sense, no. Um, I mean, a lot of the Ordnance Survey's work today, of course, is not in the hills, and so perhaps this wouldn't be that useful to them, <coughs> um, a document like this. But um, no, they, 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 as far as we're aware, they don't have a document. It has been circulated to, to one member of the Ordnance Survey. Well, it's been um, very good meeting you today and uh, talking about um, the definition of uh, summits and calls of uh, mountains. And uh, Graham Jackson, many, many thanks. Okay, Merthing. Yeah, cheers. Mm.